there's still more improvements we can make in our Reservoom WPF application. For example, what if a database interaction takes a little bit longer than expected? We would probably want to show some kind of loading indication there. What if the user enters data that is invalid? We would probably want to notify them about that data so that they could fix it. And lastly, what if some kind of error happens whenever we save data to the database or read data? We would probably want to report that error to the user. So that being said, we are going to focus on setting up loading indicators, implementing data validation for user input, and reporting error messages on our UI. So we're going to start off by setting up a loading indicator whenever we load data from the database. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hard code my database interaction to take a little bit longer than expected. So we will just do a task delay and delay for two seconds, so 2000 milliseconds. And now if we run this, we will see on the UI, here we go, empty, and then two seconds later, then it populates. But how was I supposed to know that the data was loading? There was no indicator, but we are going to add one. So that is going to go on our reservation listing view model. We're going to need some kind of property for is loading. So let's define that. This will be a prop change. So got to raise on property change whenever this changes. And it's just going to be a Boolean for is loading. And now we just need to toggle this Boolean whenever we load. So that loading is done in the load reservations command. And we have a reference to our reservation listing view model in this command. So before we start loading, we can set the view models is loading that we just added to true. And then when we're done loading, we'll set it to false. So we'll put this into a finally. And actually, we don't have to because this will not throw exceptions. So we can just set is loading the false whenever we're done loading. And let's make sure that worked out OK. So there we go. We set is loading the true because we are loading now. And now still loading, still loading. And then we're done. So we set it to false. So now we just need to update our UI to show some kind of loading indicator rather than our empty grid of reservations. So that is in the reservation listing view. And we have our header here. So that's always going to be visible. But then we have our list view. And we want this to be not visible when we are loading. So you might think we would take our visibility and have that bind to is loading. And then we could use the built in WPF Boolean to visibility converter. But then what that would do is it would convert is loading when it's true to visible. But that's not what we want. We want when is loading is true, we want this to be invisible. So we would want the opposite of what the built in converter would do. So rather than defining a custom converter for something like inverse Boolean to visibility converter, I usually set up a style and use a data trigger so that when is loading is true, I'll set visibility to collapse. But we haven't done anything with converters yet in this series. And using a converter here rather than a style will make the XAML a lot more concise. So we are going to create a custom converter. It's good to demonstrate converters because they are pretty fundamental WPF concepts. So we have a converters folder and we are going to have an inverse Boolean to visibility converter. So all converters need to implement I value converter. So implement that interface. And for this, we are not going to be converting back. So we just need to implement convert. And what we're going to do is first type check our value that gets passed in. And in our case, it's going to be an is loading Boolean. So we are going to try and cast this to a Boolean. So if it is a bool, and we'll call this the bool value, and that bool value is true, then we're going to return visibility. So import that dot collapsed. And then if the value isn't a Boolean, or the Boolean is false, so we aren't loading, then in this case, we want to show visible. So maybe not the best idea to make this a one liner kind of hard to understand, but pretty simple converter, I guess it works in this case. Now let's use that converter. So we can have user control resources. And we're going to define an inverse Boolean to visibility converter. So we're gonna to have to import that from our converters namespace and give it a key, which in our case is just going to be the inverse Boolean to visibility converter. And now we can use that down here as our converter by specifying a static resource and pointing to our converter resource. So now what this is going to do is if we are loading, then the visibility will be collapsed. And if we're not loading, then the visibility will be visible. But before we test this out, I do want to set up our loading indicator. So what I'm going to do actually is wrap this list view into a grid so we can do a little surround width and let's move our grid row and margin onto that grid. And now in this grid, so it's going to be in the same spot as the list view, we are going to have some kind of loading indicator. So we could just have a text block for loading. But what I'm going to do is add a NuGet package that includes a loading spinner control. So this is called loading spinner dot WPF by 
singleton sean so i have a video where i go through and create this control definitely a great video for learning some fundamental wpf concepts but we don't have to worry about that for now we can just install this it's pretty easy to use as we will see and now in our grid we are going to have a loading spinner so import that from our namespace i'll just rename this to custom and now we're going to have to toggle the visibility on this as well so this is also going to bind to is loading but in this case our converter is not going to be the inverse boolean to visibility converter we just want to use the regular boolean to visibility converter which is built into wpf so a boolean to visibility converter give that a key and what this converter does let's use that down here is if is loading is true then the visibility will be visible so we will show the loading spinner so we got these two controls hand in hand that's why i wrapped them in this grid so that we could reuse the margin and the grid row. And before we test this, there is more that we can configure with this loading spinner. So we can increase the thickness a little bit. We'll go with five. We can set the color. How about a gray? I think we also need a diameter. So the size, we'll do a hundred. That should be good enough. Let's see how this looks. All right, so we load up and the loading spinner was not there, but our grid was invisible, so that's good. We just need our loading spinner to appear. And oh, I know the issue. So this is pretty dumb. So we actually have an is loading dependency property on here which toggles whether or not the spinner is visible. So we don't even need this converter. We can just bind this is loading dependency property to the is loading property on our view model and get rid of this visibility converter. So we don't need that at all anymore. And this is loading property will toggle its visibility automatically. So there we go. We see the spinner and then the reservations appear. Perfect. And the other issue I noticed is that we always have the scroll viewer over here. So to get rid of that, Head to the main window we added this last time but what we want to do is set the vertical scroll bar visibility to auto so that it's not always visible so there is other places we could add loading for example whenever we make a reservation we might want some kind of loading indicator while we create that in the database but adding that would pretty much just be doing the same exact thing we just did so we are now going to move on to data validation and the perfect place to demonstrate this is on our make reservation view so currently the start date can be after the end date so what i want to do for this data validation is display some kind of error on these date pickers if the end date is not after the start date because otherwise that just wouldn't make any sense so we're going to do all of that validation in the view model so the make reservation view model and the reason we're doing it here is because we are going to use i notify data error info so this is a pretty standard way to do validation in wpf and it allows us to do our validation in the view model which is good because then our UI doesn't have to know about our business logic. That should really stay in the view model and above, which on that note, this validation should also occur inside of our model and we should throw some kind of exception if the end date is not after the start date. So ideally we would have that validation in both places, but for now we're just gonna focus on getting that set up on the view model. So implement I notify data error info and what has that created for us? So we have an errors changed event that it just generated right in the middle of our field and property. Thank you very much. Let's move that down here. We also have a has errors property. And then we have this get errors function that returns a list of errors for a given property that we're binding to. So based on this, we see that each property can have many errors. So the best way to represent this based on past experiences is to use a dictionary. So we're gonna have a dictionary here. Usually I have fields at the top of my class, but I'm gonna keep all my error stuff together. So this can be a dictionary with the key being a string for our property name and the value being a list of the error messages. And we'll call this the property name to errors dictionary. And we'll initialize that in the constructor. So now it has errors. That'll be pretty easy to implement. We can just take our dictionary and check if it has any values in it. For getting errors, this is pretty easy as well. All we have to do is take our dictionary and do a get value or default with the property name as our key and the default value can just be an empty list so now we just need to add errors and whenever we add an error we need to raise this errors changed event so that our ui knows that there's errors and it can re-grab those so let's just do this in our end date setter for now the first thing we want to do is clear any existing errors before we set this new value so for that we can take our dictionary and remove the entry for our end date property and then if the end date is before the start date, then we want to add an error here. So in our case, we only have one possible error. So what we can do is just create a list for our errors right here and pass in our error message. So in this case, we're gonna say the end date cannot be before the start date. And then we'll take our dictionary and add an entry for our end date property 
and that'll be for these errors. But what happens here? The error is changed, so we need to raise our errors changed event. So we'll just do that right here. We'll take errors changed and invoke it with this as the sender and some data error changed event args, which just takes our property name. We'll pass that in again. And now let's head over to the make reservation page and let's put some kind of dumb date in here and let's do a whole year back and nothing quite happens. So why is nothing happening? Let's put a breakpoint here and try this again. All right, so we hit the breakpoint. Let's step through this. So we go through our validation. We add it to the dictionary and then errors changed. All good. Let's continue. Okay, so that time we had it. So it was only the first time. What is going on here? Let's try this again. Let's do same thing. All right, so we hit the setter again. Step over. Okay, so what is our start date? And here we go. Here is the issue. So we do not set the end date to the new value before we do our validation. So we're using the old value. We're validating the old value. That is not going to cut it. We got to set the value first. So let's just do that right here. In fact, we can move the one property changed up here as well. We'll just tack on the validation afterwards. And now everything should work. So let's make a reservation. Let's change this. And there we go. Now we get our error. So the only downside of validation in WPF is that we don't get our error message displayed by default. Now I have another video where I go deeper into iNotify data error info and actually override a template so that we see the error messages because that would definitely be helpful. But in this case, we're going to bypass that. Anyways, if we choose a date afterwards, there we go. Error message is gone. So now we just need to clean this up a little bit. So this could be a much more general function. Let's extract that. And that can be called clear errors. And clear errors is going to take our property name that we want to clear errors for. This is the end date. So we'll get that property name passed in. There we go. Let's move this down here with the other error methods. This could also be an on errors changed. So on errors changed. And that's going to take a property name as well. So we'll pass in end date and generate that parameter and go ahead and use it. And then lastly, we could have an add error function. So add an error, except this is going to be a little bit more unique. So this is going to take the error message that we want to add and also the property name that we want to add the error for. So let's update that up here, pass in the error message and the end date property, get the name of that. So we're much cleaner up here, but we still got to implement add error. And we want add error to support multiple error messages. So what we can do is first check if our dictionary does not contain an entry for our property, because if it doesn't, then we want to add an entry for that property. And in this case, it can just be an empty list. So now we know this property is in the dictionary. So now all we have to do is take our dictionary, get the value for our property name and add the error message into that list. And then actually we can call it when error is changed here instead so we don't have to do it everywhere and update our property name. We could also call when error is changed in our clear errors. That might be helpful. We don't really need to return here. This can just be a void. And there we go, much cleaner. And let's make sure this all worked. So here we go. Let's take our end date and put it before the start date. There we go. We get our error. But if we take this start date and put that back before the end date, then we still have our error. So what we're going to do to fix that is clear errors in our start date setter for the end date. But then what if we're clearing errors and the validation is still invalid? Well, we can check if this new start date value is actually after the end date. So we're going to do validation again. So let's just copy this, except now our error is actually just going to go on the start date and we'll say the start date cannot be after the end date. So if we're adding an error for start date, we're also going to clear errors for start date. So we get a fresh set of errors. And now we're also going to want to clear errors for start date in our end date setter, because otherwise we could face the same issue where this error message on the start date could be stale when we set the end date. But now let's send our end date back. So we get the error. Let's fix our start date that removes the error on the end date. And now Let's move our start date after the end date. And there we go. Now we get an error on the start date. So maybe that's a little bit weird. You could also have errors for both of these appearing at once by just calling add error here for the end date as well as the start date. So for example, something like this and then move the start date error into the end date setter. And there we go. Now we get errors for both if you wanted that, but I'm just going to leave it as it is. So the last thing we're going to cover is error messages on the UI. And I think for this, we're going to go back to the reservation listing view, have an error message on here. Now there's really three approaches to error messages. We can have the message box, which we have now, but it's kind of ugly, which is why I'm going to show a different way. 
You could have a global message handler, so you'd have a banner in a centralized location that would show all of your error messages. I have a video where I discuss that, but in this case, what we're going to do is just display the error message on the individual page. In this case, the reservation listing view. So in our load reservations command, let's just hard code an exception here and we're going to catch that exception. But right now we just show a message box. We don't want that. Instead, we want to have some kind of error message on our UI. So that means on our reservation listing view model, we can have a prop change for an error message, just a string. Maybe you'd want it to be an observable collection of strings if you had multiple error messages, but in this case, we're just gonna have one. And now in our load reservations command, what we're gonna do is set that error message property on our view model to our failed to load reservations. And then before we load, we're gonna wanna clear that stale error message. So we can set it to string.empty. And now all we have to do is in our UI, we wanna show the error message. So that's gonna be done after loading. So our loading indicator is gonna have a higher priority than the error message. So what we're gonna do is wrap our list view in another grid. So surround with a grid. And we're gonna move our visibility for is loading onto that grid. And now we have this new grid that's only gonna be shown if we are not loading. So if we are not loading, then we want to display our error message if we have one. So we only want to display our list view if we do not have an error message. So we can have a binding here. And what are we going to bind to? Well, we can have a property on our view model. So this can be a Boolean has error message. And that'll check if our error message is not null or empty. But this is a property that we're eventually going to be binding to. So we're going to have to raise one property changed for this property. But like, where there's no setter here well this property depends on error message so whenever we set error message we can raise on property changed for has error message and then our ui will update and re-grab this value so that means we can bind to it so we're going to bind the visibility for our list view to has error message and if has error message is true then we want our list view to be collapsed so we're going to use our inverse boolean to visibility converter here and then finally we're going to have a text block that displays our error message we'll make it red and this will need a visibility as well so we're going to bind to has error message again but this time the converter is going to be a boolean to visibility converter which we actually deleted a little while ago so we're going to need that again so just add that give it a key and now let's reference that down here in our static resource, a Boolean to visibility converter. And now we should see our error message because we are hard coding that exception. And there we go, we get failed to load reservations. But I didn't see the spinner there. Oh, and that's because we just throw the exception immediately. Let's get our spinner back. So we're gonna load first and then throw. So just to show off, we get the spinner first and then we fail to load. So one thing I wanna point out real quick that we should have addressed in the stores video is that if our loading actually throws an exception, so we load and then we throw and fail, and then we go to make a reservation and come back to this page, we don't reload the reservations. So ideally, we would try and reinitialize again if we failed. And to fix that, what we can do is wrap this lazy in a try catch. And then if it fails, we can assign the lazy to a new lazy that hasn't been initialized yet. And one sec, we actually do still want to throw here, have that exception propagate up to our command so that we can handle it in the view model. And lastly, the lazy is read only. It doesn't have to be. We can make that a non read only field. So let's get the exception back in here. We load and then we fail, but then we go back to that page and we load again. So we are actually in here again, trying to reload. Let's make sure that is true. So we do hit that breakpoint. So we do try and load again. That's good. So let's get rid of that. And lastly, I don't like the gray spinner. I think I like black better. So went ahead and made that black. So we got a loading indicator to give user feedback. We have data validation for validating bad user input, such as the start date being after the end date, which doesn't make sense. And then we showed off how to add an error message in case our loading fails or something. So we did make all these changes in just one place, but they could definitely be applied to many places in the application. For example, the make reservation page could have an error message as well and a loading indicator, but I just wanted to introduce these concepts rather than doing the same thing over and over again and being more boring than I have to be. Anyways, hopefully you can apply these concepts to your own application. I recommend doing so to give ultimate user feedback, but anyways, if you have any questions, criticisms, or concerns, be sure to leave them below in the comment section. If you enjoyed the video or are enjoying the channel, consider becoming a member. Other than that, leave a like or subscribe for more. Thank you.